Night shift working is a class two carcinogen by the World Health Organization. Night shift workers have more prostate cancer if they're men, more breast cancer if they're women. So it's your choice. You know, you're trading your health for money. Sleep is that critical that I think some people really probably should consider giving up their jobs sometimes. Couch? No, I don't recommend any head training for weeks, maybe even months. Definitely do cut down your life expectancy and, and the outcomes are pretty horrible. You know, I'd rather people do resistance training and Zotun training. Hi, I'm Dr. Amir Khan. Uh, welcome to the Dr. Khan Show podcast. We look to bring experts from around the world to share actionable insights to improve our health and more. And today we have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Michael Twyman. He is an interventional cardiologist, basically the doc that you see when you go to the hospital with a heart attack. His most recent interests include preventative and integrative cardiology. And this is what he is much more known for recently. He is a graduate of the St. Louis University School of Medicine for his med school, and his fellowship was also at the St. Louis University Hospital. Today, we are diving deep into the heart of cardiology, looking to uncover the latest in coronary artery disease uh, research, as well as tackle topics and controversies around heart disease, including the role of cholesterol, effectiveness of statins, the best supplements for your needs, the best tests that you can do to prevent heart disease. And yes, heart disease does kill one in four people directly. Dr. Twyman, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Lovely to have you here today. I'm going to start off with an important question. Usually, people start to actually worry about their health when they are in their 40s. But nowadays, Loads of people are interested in living till they're 200 years old. So what are the tools today that we have that can help predict our cardiovascular disease risk? Well, first off, you know, vascular health is intimately tied to, you know, health span and longevity. As you mentioned, you know, one in four people die of heart disease. So every 40 seconds or so, somebody is dying of a heart attack. So if you don't take care of your vascular system, you're not going to make it to 100, 120 or beyond. Um, and so you have to actually test the arteries and look at them because you can't just look at somebody from the outside and have any concept of what's really going on in their arteries at any point in time. And so there's, you know, serial, you know, non-invasive tests that you can look at. And then there's a whole host of biomarkers that you can get an idea if the arteries are going to be healthy or not. Right. So uh, when we talk about cardiac tests, we look at, you know, the EKG, uh, then stress testing, cardiac catheterization, uh, coronary calcium scoring. Uh, then clearly test, uh, then blood test that we can all haggle about which works, which does not work, and which is which is the first, which is the test that can be is the most predictive of your cardiovascular disease risk. What is the first test anybody is looking to assess their cardiovascular risk? What would that be? It's going to be somewhat dependent on what their age is. I mean, if they're over the age of forty, I usually recommend they start with a, a CT coronary calcium scan. You know, you're not supposed to have calcium in your arteries, so your score should be zero forever. But if you live long enough, often your calcium score test is going to pop positive. You just want it to be later in life, not in your 30s or 40s. Um, so I usually start with that test for people who are a little bit later. But you said earlier, you know, vascular disease starts when you're, you know, born essentially. Um, you know, the clock is ticking. So if you develop endothelial dysfunction, you're well on your way to developing atherosclerosis. You know, there's definitely studies, you know, in uh, autopsy, um, patients of uh, you know, people who got killed in wars, you know, who were 18 to 22 years old, died traumatically, but they already had fatty streaks in their blood vessels. They weren't going to die anytime soon from a myocardial infarction, but left unchecked in the 40s and 50s, they probably start showing up. Um, and I mentioned, you know, I was an invasive cardiologist for many years, seen lots of heart attacks. And oftentimes that's the first time somebody has any signs or symptoms that they have heart diseases, they're actually having a heart attack. Um, and so, you know, we're just waiting until you have an EKG or a positive stress test or cath. You know, you're really late to the game and you're hoping they can save your life at that point. You know, that's why I got interested, you know, many years ago, like, how do you actually get to the root cause of it? And it really starts with endothelial dysfunction. Right. So you were talking about endothelial dysfunction. The primordial question is that there are different pathways, right? But how does cholesterol actually enter into your blood vessel? How does it actually break through the walls? And then there's, of course, a big debate about what what starts the irritation or what's the um, initial injury or insult to the vessel wall that leads to cholesterol getting deposited into your blood. And then there's a whole process of oxidation that can lead to, lead to much more significant heart disease. And as you mentioned, that you can be 
as early as after, in your early childhood, before even you're 10 years old and you have fatty streaks in your blood vessels, what is the mechanism by which cholesterol actually starts to go into your walls? It's classically thought that it's, you know, the endothelium becomes dysfunctional for whatever reason. There's lower nitric oxide availability. The lipoproteins are then going to adhere to the endothelial lining, get retained, and then become part of the intima, where then the monocytes, you know, part of the immune system comes in and investigate, hey, what's coming in here? And then the monocytes start to gobble up the lipoproteins, and then the plaques start developing. But you know, even if you have a healthy endothelium and glycocalyx, it is still possible for the ApoB containing particles to get into the lining of the walls. It's just less likely. Okay, so there's a big debate happening is uh, cholesterol is in our blood and it can come through diet. It may not come through the diet. We are generating cholesterol ourselves. And then there's LDLC, then there's uh, HDL, um, then there are uh, different particles and particle sizes. What is the biggest risk that you feel is is the most necessary element that we need to monitor? So I think it's mostly just educating people what is actually going on. You know, cholesterol is not bad for you. You know, you're not going to be alive if you don't have cholesterol. It's the lipoproteins that are carrying the cholesterol through your blood vessels, which potentially could be a problem. And it's the apolipoprotein B or ApoB containing particles. So those are the LDL particles, the VLDL particles, the ILDL particles, and LPLA which up to 20% of the population has LPLA. So it's able to be particles that people need to be monitoring. Right. And a lot of debate in the past, you would call, yeah, as you mentioned that these are just, you know, particles. Uh, however, in the past, uh, LDL was, would be bad cholesterol. HDL would be the good cholesterol. Um, currently, uh, more ApoB is considered a better marker. And you also mentioned LP little a. Uh, then there's uh, people considering that, okay, you have to look at um, homocysteine levels, uh, CRP levels, um, inflammatory markers, uh, interleukin-6 perhaps. Um, how does this all tie in? This is tricky for, for I wouldn't say cardiologists, but at, at least regular physicians. How would a regular individual or a patient go about assessing, okay, what is good and what is not not, not that great? So you mentioned many of the tests, and those are great markers. You know, I usually break them down to three big buckets. So there's a bucket that's going to be affecting nitric oxide and nitric oxide availability. There's going to be a bucket that looks at inflammation and oxidative stress. And there's going to be a bucket that looks at the lipoproteins. And there's various vendors or lab companies that can do these tests. I just particularly tend to use a lot of Boston Heart Lab and Cleveland Heart Lab because they have a lot of the inflammatory markers that I want to look at. And, you know, just start with a few of them. And then as you get more comfortable with them, then you branch out and start looking at them. But, you know, the, the failure is to think that it's you know going to be simple. You know, if it was just about cholesterol, smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity, there wouldn't be heart disease. Unfortunately, there may be 395 other risk factors affecting your arterial lining. So that's why I'm so big about talking about the endothelium and the endothelial glycocalyx. Yes, lipoproteins are important, but it's the response to what happens to the injury of the artery. It's the oxidative stress. It's the inflammation. It's autoimmune dysregulation. That's what's really the problem. You're just trying to stop that process from kicking off these cascades in the arterial wall. Right. So endothelial dysfunction, uh, a huge topic, and we are looking to you know learn more about it. And um, and it can be fairly perplexing. Uh, how does endothelial dysfunction actually happen in the first place? And um, genetic factors or modifiable factors and how it can we mitigate uh, them? That's the initial injury that we're looking at. And how, how do we go about you know, minimizing that as much as possible? So the endothelium is the inner lining of your blood vessels. It's one cell thick and lines the entire luminal surface of the arteries. And if you could strip out your endothelium from your arteries, it'd be approximately the surface area of six tennis courts. So it's one of your largest organs you don't know you even have. But the endothelium also is protected by something called the endothelial glycocalyx, which is sugar husk or sugar coating in Greek. It's a protective coating. Think of it as like if you took a fish out of water and it's slimy, that's essentially the consistency of the endothelial glycocalyx. And the endothelial glycocalyx was first visualized in the 1960s with electron microscopy. And only in the past few years has it become more and more uh, relevant that it's the endothelial glycocalyx that's actually protecting the endothelium. And so when this glycocalyx gets injured by oxidative stress, inflammation, 
insulin, glucose, heavy metals, infections, infinite insults, then the underlying endothelium is impaired. And when the endothelium is impaired, it stops releasing as much nitric oxide. Without nitric oxide, the arteries become stiffer. Your blood pressure starts to rise. Without nitric oxide, the lipoproteins, the white blood cells, they start sticking to the artery like Velcro, and then they can kick off this cascade that's going to lead to plaque. Uh, and plaque develops, you know, gradually. And there's an inflammatory cascade, as you uh, mentioned. Um, what are the earliest markers that we can look to identify and then look to limit the progression of, the, of plaque and disease? Um, and how would you go about um, in clinic, perhaps? How would you go about with a patient? Okay, okay the, I'm going to assess you're 40 years old, let's say, for example, and you're otherwise healthy. You don't have diabetes, um, but uh, you're worried about your heart health. But of course, everybody has a bit of uh, inflammation um, and, and risk for heart disease is, is not negligible for anybody, right? So 40-year-old guy coming in, what would you look at first? So if the guy is truly you know, asymptomatic, then you know, I you know, always break it down into the biophysical and the biochemical. So the biophysical is you know, what are going on with the arteries? So in my office, you know, we assess patients' nitric oxide availability with multiple tests. You can start with just salivary nitric oxide testing. There's different vendors that make these test strips. You put saliva on them. The brighter red they are, the more oral uh, nitric oxide pathways are working well. Then just the, you know just a regular old blood pressure, checking blood pressure on both sides, uh, the brachial arteries because some people have a differential because they have subclavian stenosis or another problem with their arteries. So you know take the arm that has the higher blood pressure, but your blood pressure really should be less than 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury at all times. Our device is a little bit more novel because we'll also assess central blood pressures. Those are the blood pressures that the coronary arteries, the aorta, the carotid arteries, and the vital organs all sense. And that's the pressure you're really monitoring. And so I was an invasive, you know, cath lab guy, you know, we were using pigtail catheters and measuring these pressures invasively, but people don't like me to put needles in them in the office. So we have a device that measures it non-invasively for them. You know, a pulse wave velocity device. So most of them look like a pulse oximeter, clips to your finger. And it will measure your heart rate, of course. But as the blood leaves your heart and goes into that artery, if the artery is healthy, it's going to expand and contract. Healthy arteries are elastic arteries. So you can measure how elastic the artery is. That's pulse wave velocity. We have a device called the Endopat. It's a 15-minute stress test for your arteries. And basically, we pump up a blood pressure cuff higher than your blood pressure, cut off the flow to your arm for five minutes. And then we open up the stopcock. The blood rushes back down into the arm the reactive hyperemia occurs. So when that happens, the blood is interfacing with that endothelial glycocalyx, that protective coating. The body gets a signal, hey, here comes a big slug of blood. The underlying endothelium then releases the nitric oxide, the artery pops open, and it, you can measure how much it dilates compared to its baseline. And it should triple or quadruple in size. If it doesn't, then there's a nitric oxide availability problem. And then you can use the blood work to figure out, okay, is it high ADMA or uric acid or homocysteine or oxidized LDL? Do the and do the blood work to figure out what's driving it. But if you look at just the blood work, you don't know what's going on with the arteries. So you have to do both. Right. No, definitely. So you mentioned a modifiable or a reversible, potentially reversible risk factor such as high blood pressure, right? And endothelial elasticity. So if we talk further about risk factors, about modifiable risk factors that people can control, uh, how does stress play a role um, with with prevention of heart disease? It's definitely one of the main pillars that I talk about with patients. I mean, everybody's, you know, hyper-focused on nutrition and exercise. I tell them, you know, it's important, but we got to manage your stress and we got to get you to sleep well if you're not sleeping well. Because if you don't sleep well, it doesn't matter what you do the rest of the day for the most part. Your mitochondria are not going to be working very well. So stress is ubiquitous. We all have it. We have mental stress you when know, we're having a conversation like this, you know, physical stress when you work out in the gym, and it's your body's, you know, how well do you recover from it? Stress isn't the problem, it's the recovery part. And you got to sleep well and you got to be able to turn it off when you need to. And there's certain genes that, you know, CMT for one, catecholamine methyltransferase. If you have an abnormal SNP, the CMT gene, stress takes a longer time for you to kind of recover from you. So you're probably going to have to do more meditation, more heart math, more biofeedback, more you know, deep breathing exercises, you know, cold plunging, whatever you like to do to kind of mitigate the stress. Because stress is a killer, literally, if you don't know how to mitigate it. You know, you keep your cortisol high, your adrenaline high, your arteries, endothelium is going to keep getting impacted by this. And so you got to find ways to monitor your stress and mitigate it if it's high. So 
the quick and dirty way is you can look at heart rate variability as a metric of how much stress your body's being you know sensing right at the moment. It's not a perfect metric, but it's a good starting point for many people. Um, can you talk about what is actually heart rate vari variability? People you know hear about it, but they don't awfully clear about what it actually is. Sure. So, you know, your heart rate is how many beats per minute. The heart rate variability is measured in milliseconds. It's the time difference between each individual heartbeat. And as you're breathing in and out, you're activating your vagus nerve, and you're going to have an expansion and contraction of your heart rate. So your heart rate's not always 70 beats a minute like a metronome. As you're breathing in and out, it's going to be 70.5 and 69.5. And then, you know, that swing is what you're measuring with heart rate variability. You know, it's mostly utilized, you know, after patients had myocardial infarctions, they'd be monitored in telemetry wards, and the patients who had worse heart rate variability, you know, had worse outcomes at 30 days. People had better heart rate variability, they did better. But, you know, I see it, you know, a lot of times extrapolated out into the healthy users, and they're, you know, wearing different wearables, and they're all freaking out about the HRV. Well, a lot of these wearables aren't even that sensitive. So, you know, first, you know, test on a different device to see is it truly low or not. You know, if your HRV is really low, you know, then, you know, maybe it's an issue with, you know, you're getting sick, you're overtraining, you know, you're, you know, having some type of food sensitivity. So you try to figure out what's driving heart rate really low. But I always recommend patients, if they're really going to look at it, you really need to use a chest strap. You know, the majority of the, the rings, the watches, they're just not sensitive enough to pick up the, that uh, R to R interval. Um, so wear a chest strap if you really want to know. Right. So we were talking about stress. And uh, I mean, of course, stress has been related with strokes, heart disease, and emotional people. Um, and type A personality individuals. I think I may be one of them. <laughs> but having said that, you mentioned a few things. I think uh, meditation. What techniques or is it anything that can calm the person down that you think will work? And is there a way to quantify stress, perhaps? Is there any way that you can really quantify stress or is it just very subjective? So, I mean, I always meet the patient where they're at. You know, not everybody's going to be a, you know, into meditation from the beginning, you know, meditation sometimes is very challenging because you don't get the feedback like, is it working? You know, meditation works for me. I like it. So I keep doing it, but I've also done biofeedback and neurofeedback and box breathing. So you just find what works for you. Um, but I like people to, you know, try to use monitoring their heart rate variability. You know, I like heart math. Heart math is biofeedback. It uses heart rate variability as a metric, but it's color coded. You know, if it's red, you're out of balance. If it's green, you're back in balance. So you know if the activity that you're doing, the breathing exercise with heart math is working for you. Um, and yeah, you can look at blood markers. I mean, you can look at, you know, glucose levels. You can look at cortisol levels. You can see these things and, you know, how high they are and then be like, okay, they need to work harder to get these things back down. So we're talking about modifiable risk factors, right? Um, and what we can do. Uh, what would be next? Would exercise be something on the top of your list, a sedentary lifestyle versus a more active lifestyle? And what type of exercise would would you recommend that has been more known to help out with heart disease? I mean, exercise is the best anti-aging drug you can ever do, you know, um, and it's something that is use it or lose it. So, you know, if you're a very fit athlete in your 20s and now you're 40 and a couch potato, you don't get points for, you know, being fit 20 years ago. It's like, what are you today? You know, the job is not to be fit once, it's to be fit for life, you know, but you got to find activities that you're going to like to do and not get injured doing. Um, and so, you know, it's a combination of things, you know, yes, there's going to be some cardiorespiratory component. There's going to be strength training, flexibility, balance, but start probably with the strength training. If you're doing nothing, start with strength because you need muscle mass to age well, you know, and then, you know, how many times a week? Probably two or three times a week of, you know, whole body exercises. And if you don't know what you're doing, find a trainer who can design a program for you, you know, but then the cardiorespiratory fitness, which is something that, you know, you know, I'm pretty well familiar with, you know, I've done, I don't know how many stress tests in my life. Um, you know, there's two kind of components, you know, there's the zone two, the, the low and slow, where you're building your base of function. You know, that's probably about 80% of your time should be spent in zone two type training. And then maybe 20% of it would be the you know, high intensity interval training or the you know, VO2 max uh, type of training. Right. So you are in favor of high intensity interval training. So different types, uh, people use weights for that. People use cycling or running. What do you do or have you suggested, uh, do you suggest any particular form of HIIT training exercise or just has to be that you have to get your heart rate high very quickly and uh, do anything that can be beneficial? 
So I wouldn't say I'm a fan of it for everybody. It's, you know, if you're, you know, well-conditioned, yeah, definitely have layer in some HIIT training. But, you know, if you're coming straight from the, the couch, no, I don't recommend any HIIT training for weeks, maybe even months. Start slow, zone two training. You know, you should not even be out of breath during this type of activity. You got to build up that mitochondrial base first before you're going to push the peak super high. You know, I'd rather people do resistance training and zone two training, get that in sync, and then layer on the HIIT training later. So previously and it's good that exercise muscle building is strength training is is coming into the mix for the last you know couple of years or a decade or so and in the past it was all about aerobic exercises and why do you see there's a shift happening that you have to combine aerobic exercises uh, with strength training and uh, weight exercises um, what's the change that's happening what's the research that is actually pushing us towards this direction well, my good friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons, you know, at the forefront of this, you know, she has a concept of muscle-centric medicine. You know, your muscles are your organs of longevity. You know, they're not just there just to move you around through time and space. You know, 80% of your metabolism is going to be in your skeletal muscle. And if you age poorly and you become sarcopenic, you're going to have a very poor last few years of your life. You know, if you fall and break your hip, you know, you've got 30% mortality in one year if you break your hip. So you have to think about your muscles now, you know, you lose them as you age. It's just how fast are you going to lose them? And so it's a never ending battle. So you have to eat high quality dietary protein to have the amino acids to give them to the muscles so that you can lay down more muscle units and you have to stimulate the muscles with progressive overload. So, uh, so muscle centric medicine is really, you know, taking off in the past few years. No, definitely. And, um, Dr. Gabriel Loin, as well as I believe Dr. Peter Atia they are strong advocates of weightlifting in a way and muscle training. Um, and as you mentioned that when you go grow older, you don't have the muscle, you fall down, you break a hip and breaking a hip or uh, falls and fractures such as that definitely do cut down your life expectancy and, and the outcomes are pretty horrible. Um, and I think Dr. Peter T also talks about balance. You, uh, I mean, weightlifting, everything is fine, but you need to work on your balance and make sure all your muscle groups that are related to your uh, uh, functioning not just you know uh, extension and, and and flexion of your joints but a wide range of exercises that can help you prevent falls and keep you more independent and and possibly i think this is where in the future um this will be part of guidelines that so right now it's it's more about medication do more activity but uh, i think Correct. this has to come into the mix and so we talked about a couple of modifiable risk factors um, I can probably think of a few more. For example, sleep hygiene could be could be an essential aspect of um, mitigating your cardiovascular risk. And uh, every people talk about how much sleep you should be getting. Where do you stand on this? I mean, if there's you know four pillars of health that you know most people want to talk about, you know, nutrition, exercise, stress. Sleep is the foundation. You know, if you don't sleep well, you will not age well. If you don't sleep well, you're going to have more risk of high blood pressure heart attack, stroke, heart failure, you know, and it's not all sleep apnea, though there's a large component to uh, sleep disordered breathing and increased cardiovascular risk. So I'll simplify it for patients that, you know, your mitochondria, they're the organelles in your cells that make energy for you. They repair when you sleep. So if you don't sleep well, you don't repair your engines. Now you can put in premium gas all you want next day. Your engines aren't going to burn it very well if you're not sleeping well. Now, how much sleep do you need? It's going to vary, but you know, most people need between seven and a half and eight hours of sleep. Now, if you're an extremely fit, healthy individual, a little bit less might be okay for you. But if you're sicker, you're going to need more time to repair those engines, essentially. No, definitely. And there was an aspect that if you, your sleep is not um, adequate or your circadian rhythm is not uh, well, uh, is is not, you know, you have frequent fluctuations in your rhythm and you do night shifts perhaps and mm -hmm. Uh, I believe I've been guilty of such uh, working in the hospital and you as well having to um, stay up for your nights and cathing, cardiac cath in the cath lab at night coming in for those STEMI alerts. How does this play if you have an irregular sleep schedule? How does that affect your cardiovascular risk or does it, uh, does it matter a lot? I mean, at this time, you know, I have a perfect sleep schedule. I mean, my circadian rhythms are well dialed in. You know, I have, you know, the, the, Lucky the you. biohacker blue blockers on, you know, because it's, you know, past sunset and I don't want those blue photons of light hitting the back parts of my eyes. But no, definitely during my, you know, 
residency and internal medicine, my cardiovascular fellowship and the first few years of my practice, yeah, there's a lot of circadian disruption. And, you know, that's always going to be present. That's partially in part why I walked out of the hospital four years ago and I've not walked back in since. You know, it's because I had to make sure that my circadian rhythms were dialed in so that I could age well, so that I can keep taking care of patients and teaching them that. So it's, you know, leading by example. So I don't mess with my circadian rhythms. I don't work in the middle of the night anymore by choice. And, you know, there's going to be a time and place where people got to make that choice for them. You know, I understand that doctors have to work in the middle of the night sometimes, but night shift working is a class two carcinogen by the World Health Organization. Night shift workers have more prostate cancer if they're men, more breast cancer if they're women. So it's your choice. You know, you're trading your health for money or you're trading it, you know, for, you know, whatever else you're trading it for. So it's one of those things where it's like sleep is that critical that I think some people really probably should consider giving up their jobs sometimes. Okay. So we were talking about the modifiable risk factors, uh, but what about genetics? And I know the role of genetics in heart disease is always evolving. And uh, research has identified, of course, specific genetic markers that may increase your risk of cardiovascular diseases. Um, and just to point out a few, uh, you know, well-noted personalities, for example, Warren Buffett, he eats McDonald's, right? Uh, but he is, um, uh, God bless him, he's doing well. Um, Donald Trump, perhaps, he is well known for his uh, uh, lifestyle in a way. Um, but there have been studies, and I believe there was a... Um, article published in the journal Nature Genetics that identified over 95 genetic variants associated with heart disease risk. So with the genetic factors uh, that we may not be able to, you know, adjust or work against, how much do you think these genetic factors play? Um, and, and of course, we also know that uh, genes don't mean destiny uh, when it comes to many diseases, especially uh, heart disease. So what is the role of genetics in heart disease? I mean, it plays a role for sure. You know, I always ask patients, you know, first, it is a very good history, you know, tell me about your mom's history and tell me about your mom's mom. Now, I want to know about the mom's side first because I care about their maternal haplotype. I care about their mitochondrial DNA first because that is going to be the best sign how well they're going to age also gives you an idea of like how well they're going to do with light cold therapy keto diets that's more important but epigenetics has a big role in turning a lot of these other genes off and so the four big genes that i always check when there's a family history of people having events in their 40s and 50s we talked about a little bit earlier is lipoprotein little a or lp little a up in 20% of the population may have high levels of LPLA, which is the number one atherogenic particle that you could inherit. If you have an APOE4 allele, that increases the risk of vascular disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, especially if you have two copies of the APOE4 allele. There's a heart attack gene called 9P21. It mostly affects the uh, endothelial lining and the underlying intima. There's also one called KF6. So those are the big four that I check in almost everybody. But then if they have high blood pressure as well, you know, the uh, Vibrant America has a panel, Cardia X, checks about 25 to 30 different genes that affect blood pressure, looking at different markers that affect, you know, aldosterone levels, renin and angiotensin levels, you know, are you a fast or slow metabolizer of caffeine? Those all come into play sometimes for giving people lifestyle uh, interventions. And then if they have, you know, significant lipid issues, you know, then I tend to use a, a GB Insight panel. Um, that looks at about 120 different genes to tell me, okay, why are their lipids abnormal? And then we can kind of talk about different lifestyle, you know, nutraceutical supplements or medications based off of the genetics. So, you know, the genes are important to look at, but it's the same story as like, you know, what is going on with the endothelium? How much oxidative stress inflammation is present? Those are the things that you're really trying to modify. All right. So it has to be looked at holistically. And people who have a higher risk uh, on the on the scale, they're higher, higher risk on the scale than you will be more aggressive with them and have more of a heart to heart uh, talk uh, per se and try to work on their risk factors as much as possible and and you know you can you can do what you can do and you know uh, mitigate any risk uh, as much as possible uh, what do you tell people uh, who may be for example um, having hereditary forms of diseases such as uh, i believe you mentioned mm -hmm. apo e4 right right so you mentioned apo e4 um, and of course, I think that also has a correlation with Alzheimer's disease. And so these type of diseases sort of cluster together, but with regards to heart disease, how much of a larger risk it leads to for an earlier form of heart disease? 
for ApoE4 carriers. Um, it's mostly because it affects the lipoprotein metabolism. You know, the patients with ApoE4 tend to have higher levels of the ApoE-containing particles. It mostly affects the LDL receptor and the clearance of ApoE particles. Um, and so that's probably how it mostly has an effect on it. But it also increases the risk of diabetes. And if you're insulin resistant, that's kind of like fuel on the fire that really is going to damage the, the glycocalyx and then the dyslipidemia, you know, feeds forward to developing more plaque. So, you know, you get one copy of the ApoE genes from each parent. So, you know, you got to look at that and then the kid kind of helps you know, like, okay, what nutrition strategies to focus on this person or, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about medications in a moment, but, you know, patients who are an ApoE4 carrier, sometimes the real high dose, you know, um, you know, fat soluble stands, they're going to cause a lot more side effects in those individuals. Right. No, definitely. We're, we're continue to talk about, you know, the risk factors that we can modify and um, adjust possibly. So when it comes to diet, this is a huge topic and everybody's in one block. Uh, one would be uh, carnivore diet, uh, vegetarian diet, Mediterranean diet, the keto diet, of course. And what do you suggest? What is the best diet uh, with your understanding? Let's start with that. What do you think people should be eating ideally to prevent uh, heart disease and prevent the progression of heart disease? So there is no perfect diet because if there was, we'd all be doing it. Um, and so I said it earlier, you know, it's, it really comes down to the healthier mitochondria, you know. Where your mitochondria come from determines what nutrition strategy you were born to eat. You know, if your original lineage is Northern European, then you can kind of be more flexible. You know, but if you have a, you know, hemisphere, I should say like a, um, you know, a haplotype that's kind of like an L haplotype and you're equatorial, you know, you're probably more carb focused. You know, your mitochondria are very efficient, you know, using carbs for energy. But I think that the nutrition wars, and they truly are wars or religions for the most people, it's it's confusing. And it's also unproductive at really kind of telling people like what really drives their cardiovascular risk. It's not all about food. It's the glycocalyx, the endothelium, and the downstream effects from there. So I usually start with patients, you know, say, okay, what is your maternal haplotype? Because that gives us a roadmap of like what food options may work for you. You know, circadian biology, it is primordial. It has to be respected. So food is photosynthetic in nature. If it comes from a man-made plant, it is not food. You know, sunlight grows the food, you go eat it, and then your mitochondria's job is to reverse photosynthesis. Or you eat the animal, they eat the plant, and then your mitochondria reverses photosynthesis. And your mitochondria are not burning carbs and fats. It's taking in those products, running them through the Krebs cycle, and you're using the electrons and the protons to create a gradient through the mitochondrial respiratory proteins. That is what you're doing. You're eating to get the electrons, essentially. You can get electrons from grounding, get electrons from being outside in the sun and having the sunlight strike your skin. So I think people kind of conflate like it has to be a perfect diet. It's you need electrons to run the mitochondria. And so that's what I focus on is teaching people how to do that, how to get your circadian rhythms and trained, how to use sunlight properly, how to ground, you know, and then eating in season, because if the food was growing outside, your body's in sync, it knows what time of day it is, it knows what season it is. So that's why there's not a perfect diet for every individual. Mediterranean diet can work for you if you're in a Mediterranean type of environment. And so we're talking about mitochondrial health. How about fasting? And intermittent fasting, has that been known to affect mitochondrial health? It can because, I mean, you know, when you're eating, you know, you're causing oxidative stress. You know, you're using the oxygen in the foods to combust them. Um, and some of that right off species is going to uh, escape out and potentially damage the DNA of the mitochondria. So that's one of the ways that fasting helps is that you're just not running the machinery 24-7. Um, and, you know, but, you know, how long do you have to truly fast before, you know, autophagy is really kicked in? I mean... I don't know if anybody knows for sure, but it's probably somewhere at least two to three days before it's maximally turned on. Um, and so I'm, you know, hesitant to give people like a blanket, like, oh yeah, fasting is always good for you. It always depends. You know, why is that person fasting? You know, if they're hundred pounds overweight and very metabolically sick, then fasting may be useful for that person. But if the person is more frail, if they fast too much, they're going to be, you know, really eat into their muscle mass. And then when they refeed, you know, they're going to have a harder, hard time with their metabolism. You know, they'll become skinny fat over time. Um, and so I'm not a huge fan of people, you know, having, you know, long fast without clear cut goals. Right. You mentioned skinny fat. Um, 
Is that the worst type of phenotype? I don't know if it's the worst, but it's the one where people get confused that they think they're metabolically healthy. You know, they did a DEXA scan. They'll see they have very low lean muscle mass. You know, their body fat percentage would be high. And the worst would be that if they actually have visceral fat on top of it. So they, you know, they look thin, but their organs are, you know, very inflamed from all the fat being deposited on them. Right, right, right. Let's say, for example, somebody has plaque. Has there been any studies or do we know if plaque can be reversed? And we'll get into a calcified versus non-calcified. But to your knowledge, is there a sure shot way by which people can actually reverse their plaque? Is there something people can do? I mean, I see it all the time in my practice. Um, you know, the first you got to stop doing the damage. And that's the hardest part because most people don't always, you know, think about that part. It's like, you know, you take all the medications in the world, but if you're not stopping the damage, it's going to keep happening. You know, that's why you see the same type of pattern in the hospital is that the guy who had a heart attack two years ago is the same guy coming in and he was already taking his statin and his beta blocker and his aspirin and his ACE inhibitor. He's like, why? Well, I took all my medicines. Well, you didn't fix the endothelial dysfunction. You didn't lower the inflammation or make it metabolically healthy. Um, and you know, that's kind of a complicated topic to say what's metabolically healthy, but you know, if you don't actually do the things that you need to do to fix the arteries to begin with, you're not going to stabilize that plaque. You're not going to get that plaque to regress. And so you have to have healthy nitric oxide levels. We have to have minimal inflammation, oxidative stress, and then the lipoproteins need to be modulated. Often that ApoB particle has to be less than the 20th percentile. So an ApoB less than 70 before you can even see a possible plaque regression. You know, they used resuvastan, which was Crestor in the Jupiter trial, and they were showing carotid plaque regression using intravascular ultrasound. So definitely have been shown that, you know, with the right doses of statins, you can do that. But statins are just one tool that does that. PCSK9 inhibitors, um, have they played a role for you in your clinic? Oh, definitely. You know, I, I don't know the literature too much on that they have for actual true plaque regression, but it's plausible because they're very potent at lowering uh, ApoB. Um, and, you know, the side benefit is that they also tend to lower lipoprotein A 20 to 30%. Still unknown if that's clinically important, but that's the only benefit that you get from that is a uh, I should say that that's the only thing other than apheresis that really has much of a movement on LPLA levels. Um, but no, I have a lot of patients uh, who utilize them because they're, they're statin intolerant or they're not getting into goals with statins. You know, it's the, you know, you said earlier about, you know, we're talking about genetics, but that's how they kind of figured out this. You know, I have a family member with, you know, loss of function, PSSK9 gene. It's one of the longevity promoting genes because, you know, this person's ApoB has been in their 40s their entire life, naturally, no medicines, no supplements. So the drug company studied people like my family members, and they created, you know, Repath and Prelimit based off of this with the monoclonal antibodies. So, yeah, so, you know, we talked about the genes that you can get that worsen your atherosclerotic risk, but there's, a, you know, there's other ones that actually lower the atherosclerotic risk. And, you know, the people who live to 100, that doesn't mean that, you know, everybody's going to be able to eat hamburgers and Coca-Cola and make it happen. But, you know, there are certain people that, you know, their genetics do favor them, but um, it's test on guess. Look at your arteries. What is your arteries doing? That's what really matters. Yeah, individually. So we're getting into more of individual tests. Coronary calcium scanning, what role does this play? I know this is a very common test that people do, and it's very easily available um, and very cheap as well. You also mentioned about this. Would you suggest this to be a better test than something else on the market, for example, clearly test perhaps? It's not better than a clearly scan. It's a different type of CT scan. Um, and I'll, I'll explain the difference between the two. Traditionally, you know, patients don't normally go to a cardiologist unless they're having symptoms. You know, if they're having chest pain, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, they see a cardiologist, they do an EKG, they put them on a treadmill, they do a stress test. If it's abnormal, they go to the cath lab and maybe they get a stent. Or the stress test is normal, they say, well, you probably don't have severe blockages, and then they treat their blood pressure or lipids, whatever they find. But yeah. you want to look for the plaque before you even have symptoms because, like we said earlier, you know, 50, maybe 70% of the time, people have heart attacks. They had no symptoms before that heart attack took off. Um, and so the CT coronary calcium test kind of helps restratify people into low risk or high risk. So calcium is supposed to be in your bones, not in your arteries. Calcium in the arteries indicates that you have plaque in the arteries, and the body is trying to take care of that plaque by putting smooth muscle over it and eventually calcifying that plaque, literally putting bone in the arterial wall to seal the plaques into the artery wall to prevent it from rupturing. So the calcium score test should be zero forever, and I've seen patients in their 80s with calcium scores of zero. Now, when should you start it? You know, most guidelines are going to say 45. I used to say 40, but I've seen patients, you know, 36 with very high scores, so 
probably move my target down to 35 is a decent time to start. You know, especially if somebody has a family history, you know, if their dad had events in their 50s, screen people at least 10 years earlier than when their parents had an event. Um, but that being said, if your CT corneal calcium score is zero, you're a very low risk individual from, you know, for the next five years at least probably. You know, the, the quoted data is that it's about a 0.4% risk of having a heart attack or stroke if your calcium score is zero. It's never zero because you can still have soft plaque that doesn't get picked up on that scan. Um, but at least get you ballpark started, you know, high risk, low risk. You know, if your score is over 400, that's considered high risk. Over 1,000 is very high risk. And I've seen scores as high as 7,700. You know, so it's a wide variety of uh, values you can see. But if your score is zero, you would likely repeat it within three to five years to see, is it still zero? But if your score is above zero, there's really no strong reason you should ever repeat it to start treating that individual. They've already demonstrated that they're higher risk. They're already laying down plaque. So it's a good test. Most of the time, the test is about $100 to $300 in most you know, low cows. So usually approachable for most people. The other test that you mentioned, it's a more sensitive test, but it's a little bit different in that it requires an IV. It requires IV contrast. You often have to take a beta blocker to slow your heart rate down to the 50s and 60s because you know the heart is always beating. And the faster your heart's beating, the more artifact can be uh, picked up on a CT scan. Um, so you have to have normal kidneys because the contrast gets filtered out of it. You can't have a contrast allergy or you got to be pre-medicated with it. So it's a little bit more challenging to get person to the scanner. There's more radiation with the CT cornea angiogram than there is a calcium scan. The calcium scan test is about equivalent to a mammogram for women. Um, but the CT angiogram can actually quantify not only the degree of stenosis or blockage in the arteries, but starts looking at the quality of the plaque in the arteries, especially when you layer on the, the Clearly analysis. So Clearly is a, a company that has an AI algorithm that voxel by voxel chops up the CT cornea angio uh, images and will quantify the total plaque volume in the arterial wall. So if you think of like an artery as like a, you know, a garden hose, how much of the wall of the garden hose actually has plaque in it? Sometimes I also use the analogy of like an iceberg, you know, plaque is growing, you know, below the surface of the ocean and eventually kind of pops its head out with the tip of the iceberg. So it clearly can actually quantify the total plaque volume, but then it will give you the hard plaque, how much soft plaque and how much low density plaque is present. And it's that soft plaque and that low density plaque that is likely the more vulnerable plaque, the plaque that's more likely to pop and cause heart attacks. All right, definitely. The calcium score may not detect the non-calcified portions, and those are the portions that um, are more likely to cause, cause an acute problem as, as such. Um, and I think that goes to show that uh, it was considered or possibly still considered uh, by many cardiac catheterization as the gold standard in um, in diagnosing your risk for or at ruling out coronary artery disease in a way uh, that, okay, you have a cardiac catheterization, it's clean, you don't have any blockages or stenosis that could be opened up perhaps, and then you're okay. Um, is that an accurate assessment or things are changing? No, it's absolutely not a true assessment. And I can definitely, you know, do, tell that from a personal experience. You know, I did you know, hundreds, if not thousands of casts before I kind of retired from the cath lab. You know, having clean cores is not a guarantee that you won't have a heart attack. You know, 99% of your blood vessels, you know, are smaller than a human hair. You know, it's your microcirculation that's pumping the majority of the oxygen nutrients through your 60,000 miles of blood vessels. So, I had mentioned earlier, it's like an iceberg sometimes with the plaques. So when you do a you know an angiogram and you're you know uh, injecting contrast material down the, the arterial lumen, you're just looking for stenosis. You know you can eyeball if the arteries are very calcified. You can see that when you're on the fluoroscope, but unless they do intravascular ultrasound, you're not actually looking in the walls of the arteries where the plaques are actually hiding. So unless the plaque is large enough to occlude flow, and you you know, visually see something 70% or greater restricting flow, or you do a fractional flow reserve uh, where you pass a wire, pass the obstruction and measure, you know, the, the flow past the obstruction. If it's, you know, less than a certain value, then they say, oh, it's, you know, area is likely ischemic. We should intervene on this artery with either a stent or bypass. You know, you just say, oh, they, they have non-obstructed disease and should be medically managed. Well, yes, everybody should be medically managed, but that doesn't mean that they're low risk by any means. You know, they could have a lot of plaque in the arteries that could rupture the next day. You know, they just didn't require a stent at that time. So, um, so you know, the angiograms, you know, having a clean angiogram is not a guarantee that you're necessarily low risk for a heart attack.
right? Just be on the watch. And you mentioned stress testing and at the hospital, it's routinely done to if a person is coming in with chest pain and they don't have any other markers for heart injuries, such as troponins leaking, and the patient is no more having any chest pain, a stress test will do the job and you will send people home. How good is a stress test? How reliable is a stress test? So that's a better indication for using a stress test is you're trying to recreate that person's symptoms. You know, can you get them to have chest tightness or pain or shortness of breath or EKG changes while they're exercising? Um, but exercise is the appropriate stressor. You now, if you can't exercise, that's already put you into a high risk category. Now, if you did had a recent orthopedic injury, that's a little bit different, but like if you just could not keep up it on a treadmill because you're that out of shape, that's a very bad sign. So you always want to try to do some type of exercise one, either a treadmill or bike, or, you know, there are old school in the VAs where they got arm cranks and same one those done in 15 plus years, but do some type of exercise component but they're not very sensitive or specific to do just exercise. So often you add some type of imaging, so either an echocardiogram or a uh, nuclear uh, imaging component to it. Those get into like the mid 80% sensitive, but you're still going to miss, you know, 15, 20% of people with stress tests. You know, it's rare that it's going to miss a severe blockage in one of the three coronary arteries, but it can. Um, and so oftentimes the symptoms are going to trump whatever the stress test shows. So you just want to see that they have very good exercise tolerance, that their heart rate came up appropriately with exercise and then dropped at least 12 beats a minute in the first minute after exercising, that their blood pressure came up appropriately, but not too high. So shouldn't be, you know, 250 millimeters of mercury systolic. You know, that's a hypertensive response exercise. That's a very you know, poor prognostic feature, even if you don't see ischemic changes on the EKG. So stress tests are good in those situations, um, but they're not perfect. And so that's why you want to layer on a lot of this other testing. No, definitely. So we talked about a couple of tests and um, I would like to touch on a couple of medication and we talk about statins and resuvastatin. There's a huge debate about statins and its benefits and it causing diabetes perhaps. And uh, on the internet, on YouTube, uh, it gets a very bad rap. Um, regards to causing diabetes. Uh, the number needed to treat that people talk about is low for statins and myalgias, muscle pains. And one group suggests that, okay, um, it causes myalgias, muscle pains, low exercise performance in a huge majority of individuals. Uh, however, of course, a lot of studies are there that those are you know, not uh, as inflated as people uh, seem to consider. How do you go about prescribing uh, working with statins and how do you mitigate people's viewpoints when they come and talk to you regarding statins? I think that's probably the biggest hurdle. Sure. I just tell people, you know, stands are tools and sometimes they're the right tool for the job. So always start with, you know, what is the health of the arteries? You know, is this secondary prevention where the person's already had a heart attack, a stroke, they got stents, they've had bypass? Okay. Often stands are going to be useful in that situation to reduce recurrent events. Where it gets tricky is more for the primary prevention where people have never had events and they have, quote, high cholesterol. You know, stands absolutely should not be in the water, especially for younger women, you know. But oftentimes, if you do the right blood testing, you can figure out which patients are more likely to have side effects from them than others. So I particularly like to use the Boston Heart Lab panel for this, where, you know, you will look at the, you know, traditional lipid panel, but you're going to look at the lipoprotein. So what is their LDL particle number? What is their ApoB? If you use the cholesterol balance test, you can see if they're a hyper producer of sterols. If they are, then stands tend to work better for that individual. If they're a hyper absorber of sterols, often azetamide is a better option than that person. Um, and then looking at the APOE alleles. So if they're an APOE 2 or 3, stands often will work okay for them. You know, if they're an APOE 4 allele and you use a high dose, they're often going to have more side effects. The other things that tend to cause more side effects with stands is if they're vitamin D deficient, which is, you know, basically an endemic issue for most people. And vitamin D is a hormone. It's not a pill that you take. Vitamin D is made when you go out in the sun and UVB light strikes your skin, sulfates the cholesterol and turns it into vitamin D. So if you're vitamin D deficient, you're much more likely to get myalgias on stands. If your CoQ10 levels are less than three, you'll often get more muscle symptoms. If you're hypothyroid, you will get more muscle symptoms. There's another gene that I don't check in everybody, but if they've tried one or two stands and they said that, you know, they can't tolerate because of muscle cramps or pains, often check the gene SLCO1B1. If you have an abnormal copy of that gene, three to four times increased risk of muscle symptoms. So stands aren't the right tool for that person. Use something else. Um, you know, there's Nexitol if you have a production issue. There's the PCSK9 inhibitors. There's azetamide. You know, there's nine 
10 other things you can use before I was just saying that, you know, they can't take anything for their lipoprotein management. And as your question about the diabetes, yes, it's at risk. You know, it's never been shown with pravastatin though. So if people are really concerned about it, then, you know, consider using pravastatin. Um, but it's not been the case where it's like you have, you know, a blood sugar of, you know, 70, let's say, and your A1C is 5.1 that you go on a stand, you're also going to have blood sugars in one, you know, the two hundreds and your A1C shoots up to seven. It's not going to do that. It might raise your blood sugar a few points, but on par with what else? Like, did it lower inflammation enough? Did it lower the lipoproteins? Did it support endothelial function? Okay. It's a net positive, even though it might've raised the blood sugar a little bit. Okay. You can mitigate that by doing more, you know, resistance training or more zone two training or, you know, modulating their carbohydrate intake or the, you know, the timing of their carbohydrates. You can figure out a way to control their blood sugars. So that's not the, the deal breaker most of the times. No, definitely. And it's not that we put patients on statins, every patient coming into the, the clinic, we don't throw them out like candy, but you have to meet certain criteria before you can put on any medication, perhaps, and not just statin, for example. And yeah, we have tools, we can use Pravastatin. You, one uh, statin does not work for you, we can switch it up, we can work with the dosages, we can combine a couple of medication, and probably the next medication we're going to talk about, and you mentioned is it a mib. so we can combine a couple of pills. And um, maybe we can talk more about ezetimibe for people to have a better understanding. Certain patients, they tend to be uh, hyper absorbers of, you know, oral intake of lipids, cholesterol. And ezetimibe has been used for those individuals. How have you utilized ezetimibe um, and who would be relatively ideal candidates for taking ezetimibe? So ezetimibe, you know, used to be known as Zeti. It's been on the market for you know, over 20 years, and you know, I've used it routinely in those 20 years. And the uh, the Improve It trial really showed, you know, uh, the benefit of adding ezetimibe on board of statin therapy. You know, people had less cardiovascular events with it. So it's in that category where you actually have, you know, actual hard outcomes with the medication. It does, doesn't just make the labs look prettier. So ezetimibe doesn't always work that great as monotherapy. It's really good at, you know, add-on therapy often. But Sometimes, you know, if you use the Boston Heart Lab panel or, you know, there's other companies that do the cholesterol balance test, you know, I'm using an analogy and we'll, we'll run through it here is that, you know, think of cholesterol as water going into a bathtub. You know, to prevent the water from overflowing, there's three main things you could do. You could either shut off the faucet so less water goes into the bathtub. That's basically using a statin or bimpidoic acid, which is nexlatol, reddish rice, bergamot, dial back on the cholesterol production so less water goes into the bathtub. You could open up the drain. That's what the PCSK9 inhibitors do. Express more LDA receptors, pluck those ApoB particles out of circulation. And then once the water's into the drain, azetamide makes sure that the water goes out to the sewer pipe. And approximately 20% of the population, people are hyperabsorbers of sterols, and it's the sterols that their body is producing. It's not necessarily the sterols that they're eating. And so the cholesterol is getting um, pumped back in to the portal circulation. And those people... It happens in everybody, but those people tend to be more uh, hyper responder. And so ezetimibe basically closes the door and prevents those sterols from being reabsorbed. So if your body said, get rid of you, it gets rid of it. And so, you know, it's not as potent as statins, but it's often, you know, pretty good to add on to those people. But if they're a hyper absorber, they tend to have a hyper response to ezetimibe. No, definitely. And it's good to combine a couple of medication. And if you're having muscle pains, myalgias, then you can play around and get your um, your LDL particle levels, uh, ApoBs uh, down uh, much more appreciably if you're having combined therapy, especially if you're having certain symptoms. Um, we talked about PCSK9 inhibitors, and those are medications that can technically lower your ApoB LDLC uh, quite drastically. Um, the reason it's not, I think, that common is because it, you need to really jump through a lot of hoops uh, through insurance to actually get that prescribed. But what is the scenario that in your practice that you have to start individuals on these medications? There's three on the market currently. There's Repatha and Preluent. Those are usually twice a month, or there's some variants of them that are once a month, subcutaneous injections. There's also Ilisclerin, which is a twice a year infusion. And so because they are not a pop a pill, you know, they tend to be multi-thousand dollars a year drugs if insurance doesn't cover them. And so most of the time, you know, you have to have failed trials of at least two classes of statins. Often you've had to fail azetamide getting to goal. Um, and then PCSK9 inhibitors, you know, often will be covered by the insurance companies in that situation. But 
They're mostly add-on therapies for people who are at maximally tolerant stands and not getting their goals, or they just can't tolerate stands at all, and then they get added on. They're very potent. You know, you sometimes see ApoBs, you know, being lowered 40-50% with these medications, um, and not particularly a lot of side effects with it. So, you know, I don't use them for everybody, but they do work in the people that uh, are good candidates for them. No, definitely. So we touched upon a couple of supplements and the supplement in the industry is probably as big as the pharmaceutical industry. There is a lot of benefit and a couple of supplements that could, you know, actually make a difference perhaps um, long term. And uh, garlic, you mentioned a few uh, omega-3 fatty acids, coenzyme Q. What are your go to supplements and uh, how would you you know rate a couple of sup- supplements that okay these do have a proven efficacy and safety um regards to cardiovascular health so i always love the question but you know there are no go to supplements they're just you know when people have certain deficiencies and if they don't get it through their you know exercise their nutrition then you replete them back up to optimal ranges you know but we talked about earlier the three big buckets you know what can support nitric oxide availability there's a couple of supplements that can give you nitric oxide if your body isn't producing enough of it. There's supplements that help support the endothelial glycocalyx. So if the protective coating is damaged, you can give a supplement that gives the body the building blocks to put down more of the endothelial glycocalyx. So putting the force field up. There's multiple supplements that can help lower inflammation, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, curcumin can help with it, it lowers TNF alpha, lowers CRP, uh, and then the lipoproteins, you know, we mentioned a couple, you know, there's bergamot, which acts like a statin, it's lowering HMG co-reductase, berberine is a weak oral PCSK9 inhibitor, also has effects sort of like metformin at lowering blood sugar, um, you know, those are kind of some of the lipid ones that sometimes we will utilize. CoQ10, you know, especially if a person has, you know, cardiomyopathy or they have a lot of muscle symptoms on stands, a lot of times CoQ10 might be able to help with that because it's helping support energy production in the mitochondria. Magnesium is often important for many cardiac patients. You know, if you have high blood pressure, palpitations, atrial fibrillation, um, you know, heart failure, magnesium deficiency is not uncommon. So you want to replete them back up with magnesium until their symptoms go away. Um, so those are some of the, the starting points that we, we utilize in our practice. But you know, we're checking comprehensive blood work people and then you know fine-tuning things based off the blood work. Right. Do you check omega-3 levels, perhaps? Or do you differentiate uh, between the two varieties in your practice? Does that go into your adjustments, whether you give patients or not? Correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at you know, the, the mega check levels and then looking at the specific EPA and DHA levels. And, um, you know, the DHA is critically important, especially in patients with APOE4. Um, you know, you need DHA to be able to transmit energy in your neurons. So without DHA in your brain, you know, your brain is like at half power, essentially. Um, I sometimes, you know, joke with patients that, you know, your DHA level is essentially your cell phone charge. You know, you want it to be at 100% so that your brain can work at peak capacity all day long. Um, and I you know, like to see omega-3 to omega-6 ratios, you know, generally be in the uh, four to one where you have no more than four times the omega-6 to omega-3s. Right. How often do you recommend people eat um, cold water fish, salmon perhaps? How often do you recommend that? Or do you look to rely more on supplementation to fix any def- deficiency? No, that's definitely why I uh, you know, like that question is that you know, it should be coming through dietary sources because you know, the body has a way of processing the electrons coming from you know, cold water fish, you know, and it may be completely different than you know, the fish that's in a capsule. You know, once man-made you know, processes come into play, you don't know exactly how it's going to be absorbed. So I much prefer people actually eat the seafood than supplementing with it. doesn't mean that I don't supplement people with it, but I always want them to start with eating nutrition first. And so you can do the, you know, the smash salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, herring, throw in tuna as well. Um, and, you know, two, three times a week is kind of the bare minimum and then monitor blood levels. And I believe uh, you mentioned the uh, coenzyme Q perhaps. In, I think, medical lit- literature, it's been effective for heart failure patients and patients' heart is fairly weak in the classification. Uh, however, it is used very commonly, it commonly, generally, and its supplement is available, of course, easily on Amazon. How do you go about with coenzyme Q, perhaps? 
Sure. Um, and I, off the top of my head, I can't remember the name of the trial. I want to say it was like Q-Symbio trial, uh, where they were adding on CoQ10 to patients' standard of care, heart failure regimen. So the patients are on maximum tolerated beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and uh, medications like spironolactone. And they're adding on CoQ10 and the patients had less, you know, um, hospitalizations, and I believe even mortality benefit with it. Um, but coenzyme Q10, just really want to get one that's in a gel capsule. You know, the dose, I mean, it's a rough estimate that you need about 100 milligrams of CoQ10 for each drug that you're on that depletes it. So if you're on a beta blocker, that's going to deplete CoQ10. If you're on a statin, that's going to deplete CoQ10. So you need about 100 milligrams of CoQ10 for each medicine that depletes it, then add on another 100 milligrams. So often, you know, CoQ10 is between 100 and 300 milligrams a day, but you're mostly doing it to um, get blood levels uh, generally above the value of three. No, definitely. Okay. So a couple of things that translate into what most people who most cardiac patients uh, may may need to consider and, and talk to their doctor about it and, and talk to their doctor about it. So I'm going to shift gears and a few rapid fire questions and possibly your your best tips, your best recommendations. I know we went through a couple. Um, five best tips to prevent uh, death from heart disease. <laughs> Five best tips. All right. Number one, don't ever miss a sunrise. It's that important. That's the number one tip. Your circadian rhythms more than anything else. Focus on your light and dark cycles. Number two, you know, sleep like it's your job because it really is. You know, you almost should think about like sleep is not when you end your day. It's when you start your day. You're charging up your battery and then you're going to dissipate it throughout the day. Third, you know, get outside more times than not. Like we were not supposed to be indoor beings. You know, we're supposed to be connected to the earth in full spectrum sun. And so the more you can spend outside, the better you tend to do. Fourth, if we're going to do nutrition wise, you know, eat real foods, you know, eat, you know, in a seasonal appropriate manner for you, eat foods that you know, are tied to the photosynthetic web. And fifth, do something that improves nitric oxide availability. So exercise, be outside and I already said sun, so it doesn't count. So go out and exercise a few times a week. There we go. Five things. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Now I think the next question is probably going to get you in trouble. List uh, carnivore, Mediterranean, uh, keto, uh, vegan, and uh, I don't know, <laughs> one more week we can add. Can you list which one is your best to the least favorite? I don't know if I have least the best, but it's more of that. Yeah. And I've seen all those diets work for people. And I've seen those diets, every single one of those mess people up significantly. And I tell the people, <laughs> your choice is if you want to stick to that diet because you ethically want to, that's one thing. But if you're doing it for your heart health or your muscle health, that's a completely different thing. You're going to end up on more medications or more supplements to replete the deficiencies from a diet that's unbalanced. And so I, I don't, I think anybody takes certain food things to extremes often we'll get into trouble. You know, the carnivore diet can work for many people. I've seen it work for people, but is it a diet that you can do till you're 85 years old? Maybe not. So if you couldn't do the diet for the rest of your life, then is it really something that you want to take on long-term? You know, if you have a raging autoimmune condition, I've seen it work often, but it doesn't work for everybody. I've seen a lot of people mess up their lipids significantly with it. And it's not just about the lipids, you know, that's the kind of the whole idea of the lean mass hyperresponders. It's, you know, what is going on with the glycocalyx and the endothelium? You know, do you have soft plaque building up because that that's what they're looking at right now? You know, and then the vegans, you know, I'm not opposed to people eating vegan, but it's really challenging. You have to plan your protein intake well with that, you know, because it's more challenging. You know, plant-based sources don't have the same amino acid uh, profile as animal-based and often comes with a lot of fiber and other carbohydrates with it. So the volume of food is a lot more. And so you're literally going to be chewing longer to do it that way. It's possible, but that's up to them to decide. So, you know, I don't have you know, a favorite or least favorite one to see as a patient. I always ask them like, okay, do you have a diet that you particularly want to follow? And then we try to work around that as best we can. All right. Breakfast cereals, <laughs> do you support them? Not really. I mean, they're just like trash for the most part. <laughs> and they're, they might load them as a kid, but they're not, they're not real food. Right. 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 How about eggs? No concerns for most people. Good source of protein, six right. grams each. Right. Uh, what about organic uh, grass fed versus uh, more of the industrial types? I mean, you are what your animal eats or what the plant was grown in. So, you know, organic is preferred for most things, but you know, 
I know there's supposed to be, you know, speed rounds, and I believe you had uh, Dr. Nathan Bryan on your show at one point, is that organic foods are going to have much lower nitrates because of the soil that they're grown into. So you're not going to get as much nitrates in, you know, spinach that's grown in organic conditions versus, you know, uh, traditional conditions. Fasting insulin versus fasting sugar levels versus uh, A1C. Which one do you prefer? There's a big debate about should you go after A1C or fasting sugar levels or your fasting um, insulin levels? I mean, I check all three every time in patients, but the the wheels go off you know sooner with the fasting insulin. So if you're looking at the fasting insulin, you can pick this up years before they become insulin resistant. Um, and then quick sidebars, you know, the lipoproteins tell it about as good as the insulin. So if you start seeing you know, the small LDLs increasing, you see the VLDLs going up, you see their triglycerides increasing greater than 80, they're probably insulin resistant even before their glucose they one c starts to rise. Right. Triglyceride and um, ASDL ratio, is that important? Um, I won't say it's not important, but it's not as important as people think. I mean, yeah, the triglycerides matter, but the HDL, honestly, is not, the HDLC is really not that useful a metric to look at. You have no idea what that HDL is doing in that situation. Low HDL doesn't mean that should be that, you know, it's pathogenic. High HDL doesn't mean it's actually protective. So you need to look at the HDL particle number and then look at a test called myeloperoxidase and I'll suspect if your HDL is functional or dysfunctional. If you were made the president, uh, let's say, of the United States uh, for four years and you don't have to worry about the Senate or the House and you can do whatever you want, what changes you would bring with regards to working on heart disease? I would focus on circadian biology. I would get everybody outside as much as possible. I would get people off of these blue lit tech screens if we could. You know, these screens are great that I can have this conversation. People are going to learn some stuff from our conversation. But these lights and this technology is slowly killing us. You know, we weren't meant to be in front of these alien suns all day long. It messes with our circadian biology. It messes with our mitochondria. So we do everything possible to mitigate the, the technological effects to people's mitochondria. No, definitely. All right. So where can people find you? Well, I'm located in St. Louis, Missouri. I have a practice of Pablo cardiology and you know, I do work with patients. You know, I have patients from all over the country that come in and they get assessed with us. You know, we do deep dives to figure out what the health of their vascular systems are and give them a comprehensive plan on how to kind of mitigate any risk factors that we uncover. Um, you know, I'm pretty active on Instagram. You know, I'm uh, you know, every Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time, I do an IG Live so people can uh, ask questions and uh, you know, I can kind of educate them much like in this similar manner. Um, and then have a little bit of things on YouTube as well. But, you know, those are the, the main sources where people can find me. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Michael Twyman, it was a pleasure. And hopefully we can uh, connect again sometime soon. Well, thank you for the opportunity tonight. Thank you. Thanks for watching. And if you like this, consider sharing it with your family and your friends. And do check out other videos um, on this topic that we have on the channel. I'm sure you will like it. Bye for now. Thank you so much. I appreciate you as a valuable viewer and thanks for watching till the very end. If you liked this, check out this podcast. I know you will love it. You can also check for more interesting links in the description. I'm Dr. Rakan. Looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you.